Terrific. Welcome, everyone. We're going to give folks about a minute to settle in, and then we'll and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, folks. We'll, we'll get started in about, in about 30 seconds here. Thank you all for joining us. All right, I'm getting the thumbs up. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Henry. I'm the president of the Environmental League of Massachusetts. And I'm really honored to be facilitating this conversation today. And I thank you for joining us. I think it's clear that we are at a critical juncture. We've all read the IPCC report. We've all seen the recent wildfires, the heat from the summer, the flooding. Climate change's impacts are here and we cannot wait any longer. And this is why I'm so honored to be hosting this conversation among mayors and city councilors who are equally anxious to see local, state, and federal action. I'm here today both representing the Environmental League of Massachusetts Action Fund, we're the state affiliate for the League of Conservation Voters, and, and, and representing the Vermont Conservation Voters, Maine Conservation Voters, and the team, uh, the New Hampshire team at the League of Conservation Voters. Today's conversation is part of this mayoral week of action and LCV affiliates in 32 states are engaging their mayors to help call for the passage of a $3.5 trillion reconciliation package through Congress. We all agree that it must include robust investments in climate justice and jobs. The investments we're calling for must cut US emissions by at least 50% by 2030 put our nation fully on a path to 100% clean energy, powering our grid, our new cars and buses, and buildings by 2035, to ensure that at least 40% of investments benefit low-income communities and communities of color, who, as we know, have borne the brunt of toxic, uh, toxics and fossil fuel pollution, and who we also know are the most vulnerable to climate impacts. And finally, to ensure that clean energy and climate investments can sustain high-quality jobs. So we are thrilled to have with us today four climate champs from across New England, and they're leading on climate in their cities and states, and, and we're seeing um, modeling that national leadership as well. So I will briefly introduce them and then get right to questions. Towards the end of the conversation, we'll take a few questions from the audience. So you're welcome to use the chat function, which I'll be monitoring at any point during, during the webinar. So first, um, Ann Watson, you were elected as mayor of Montpelier, Vermont in March of 2018. And that was after serving on the Montpelier City Council for five and a half years. You were city council president for three of those. You have been a really proud advocate for the council's net zero energy goal and for issues that disproportionately affect Montpelier's renting population. I should note you're a teacher at Montpelier High School. You've taught physics, engineering, and math for the past 13 years. Welcome. Next, we have uh, my friend, Jesse Lederman, an at-large city councilor for Springfield, Massachusetts. You were born and raised in Springfield. You'll see this as a, see this as a theme. You're very proud of Springfield and you've been um, the chairman of Springfield's first ever Committee on Sustainability and Environment. Um, you have served on the council since 2017 and you are front and center in the fight to stop a biomass waste incinerator plant in Springfield, which we're looking forward to hearing more about. Next, we have Sarah Nichols, a current Bangor City Councilor. You were first elected to public office in November of 2015. You were born and raised in Bangor and you went to work for the Maine Education Association. Um, I'm interested in particular that you've worked with the council to partner with the town of Orno to establish a framework for joint municipal climate action that's in line with the state's broader goals. 
And I also want to acknowledge, Sarah, you are joining us from vacation in your car. So you get a gold, a gold and silver star. Thank you so much for making time for this. Um, summers in Maine are precious, and it means a lot that you're here today. And last but not least, we have um, Mayor Joyce Craig. You are the first woman ever elected as the mayor of Manchester, New Hampshire. You were born and raised in Manchester. You are a proud Queen City and, um, and also a proud member of the climate mayors. Um, I think eight of the 13 New Hampshire mayors also um, join you on this team. You have continued the city's progress on economic development and taken real steps to protect the environment and make meaningful commitments to combating climate change, um, including a target of reducing emissions by 50% by 2030. So welcome all of you. I'm gonna start with the first question in the order that I introduced you and then we'll, and then we'll shake it up for the second question. So turning to you, Mayor Watson. Montpelier has, has really led. You are the first state capital in the nation to commit to net zero climate pollution for all city operations in 2030. It's a big deal. Can you talk to us a little bit about the types of climate actions you've taken so far and what you think it's gonna to take to meet the rest of that commitment? Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so the city of Montpelier uh, adopted this net zero goal uh, quite a few years ago now. And since then, we have made some significant progress uh, towards that goal. Uh, one thing, uh, we, we have a couple of major um, uh, projects that we did. One was we, uh, in, we built a uh, district heat plant that burns wood chips that uh, heats uh, all of our municipal downtown buildings, as well as many of our buildings in the downtown uh, renewably, which is uh, just a, a fantastic uh, project for the city that helped us switch off of burning oil for heat. <clears throat> that was a significant project for us and was, was years in the making. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we recently uh, passed a, a bond to build a, um, uh, do, to do some significant upgrades to our wastewater uh, treatment plant to increase the amount of methane that it was burning so that that facility could be thermally net zero. And uh, we're still in the process of determining what to do with the excess. We may generate electricity or we may end up drying the solids. And folks may not know that wastewater treatment facilities are often the most energy intense um, uh, operation that a municipality does. And so to have that plant be thermally net zero is fantastic. Um, yeah, so those are just a couple of big projects that we've done. Uh, other things include trying to stretch the money that we do have. We have, uh, we established an internal green revolving loan fund so that uh, projects with uh, sort of a short payback turnaround uh, could be paid for with city money. And then the savings from that could go back to uh, being reinvested in, in further projects for the city. And that has helped us uh, do things like weatherization on buildings or air sealing or making systems more efficient. Uh, which has been helpful, but it really is about stretching the money that we do have. Um, Montpelier, Vermont, though we may be the capital, we are not necessarily, we are, we're not a big city. Uh, and so we have to make every dollar count. That's a great answer. Um, and congratulations on all that progress. Uh, turning to you, City Councilor Jesse Lederman uh, from Springfield. You are leading the push right now against the construction of this biomass waste incinerator in Springfield. Um, I'm not sure how you're sleeping. I see you and I see you out there um, all the time on this issue. And the state now has these draft regulations that would remove incentives for biomass incinerators for plants that are within five miles of EJ communities. Can you tell us more about how this journey has shaped your climate agenda? Sure. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for the question. And it's great to be here with you and fellow counselors and, and mayors to talk about such important issues for our community. As you know, and as, as some folks on the, on the call may know, this has really been a more than decade long battle for the residents of the city of Springfield. This is an incinerator that you know, started out as a proposal to burn construction and demolition debris 
in the largest city in Western Massachusetts, the city of Springfield, which is our home, and really would have trucked in debris from the entire Northeast uh, to burn it in an environment mental justice community in a community that has already been impacted so strongly and so negatively by generations of concentrated pollution. And it's really one of the first initiatives that I got involved with in local government in the city of Springfield. It mobilized an entire generation uh, of individuals in the city of Springfield, cutting across neighborhood boundaries, cutting across any boundary you could imagine, um, and has continued for this long, really because unfortunately, it's taken a long time for the state's priorities to change towards where they really need to be headed, which is true, clean, green, renewable energy production. Um, what this has looked like today uh, is the fact that most recently, even though after a decade of, of fighting the incinerator, uh, we saw last year a proposal come up in a climate bill uh, to once again extend tax credits to incinerators of this nature, both in the city of Springfield and across the Northeast, something that could impact all of our communities. Uh, it really brought back that same grassroots mobilization. And what we have seen is a real serious reversal um, at the state level of their efforts to grant those types of incentives uh, for these incinerators, which have since kind of switched away from construction demolition debris and, and towards what they call green wood, which is a longer conversation as to why that is still as harmful. Uh, but the, the truth is, is that this would not have been possible without the mobilization of activists across the city of Springfield and across the Commonwealth. We are still pushing the DOER and the state legislature to strengthen these protections actions even further, uh, because what they are still proposing is a rollback of what is in place now, while it would prevent incentives from being granted to incinerators in Springfield and incinerators within five miles of an environmental justice community, it would allow those same taxpayer energy funded incentives to be granted to incinerators in other communities outside of the Commonwealth and some communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we believe that we must protect all communities from pollution, not just the city of Springfield. So there's more work to be done, but it is an incredible testimony uh, to the change that can be made when people step up to the plate. And, uh, and we've seen more than, more than one individual go on from that fight to hold elected office, to lead on environmental issues uh, in the Commonwealth. And so, um, you know, we know there's more work to be done, uh, but are grateful for what we've achieved thus far. That's great. Um, now turning to you, um, City Councilor Sarah Nichols, um, and I should have acknowledged that you were also the former mayor of Bangor as the chair of the as the chair of the City Council. So last February, the Bangor City Council adopted a resolve recognizing a climate emergency and committing to a planning process that was consistent with the state's climate action plan, which I love the title of Maine Can't Wait is the name of the plan. Can you talk a little bit about where that process is now and what's what's happening next? Yeah, so pretty much back, so in February, obviously we passed the resolve, but from that point in the past few months, because that was, I guess only a few months ago, <laughs> um, we have met with um, towns in the area. Um, Orono, as I think was alluded to earlier, we have an, an actual formalized agreement with, and for those who don't know, Orono is the town just north of us. Um, where the University of Maine is. And we started a partnership to kind of work on these things together. We are now, that was formalized. I was just checking the date, it was a month ago, oh, as of the 15th. So, I mean, that's still pretty new in terms of formalizing that. Um, and we have started to work, reach out to the other municipalities surrounding the Penobscot River area where we are to hopefully get more buy-in. Because Obviously, these things are not just imp if it impacts Bangor is going to be impacting everyone around us as well, and obviously expanded on that. Um, but also in between that time, we started really documenting all the things we had been doing because we were we had been working on all these projects like solar and uh, a lot of work on our wastewater treatment plant to um, make it well. I mean, long story short, there was we were under consent decree actually with the EPA in regards to how our our plant was set up and to could keep from stormwater overflows going into the river, we had to totally revamp our uh, sewer stormwater system, which has been to the tune of 25 plus million dollars, but it is going to save, I mean, it's going to save our river. <laughs> 
Um, so we've been trying to work on all those projects still concurrently and kind of document where we're at to see how much further we need to go based on the plan that we set back in February. So hopefully we hear back from more municipalities mm -hmm. and partners to work on this. Um, but we haven't set a meeting our first meeting yet because we only just sent out those requests to the other towns only a, few, a week ago. So still kind of new, but working fast. So, yeah. That's great. And um, and last but not least, Mayor Craig, you know, New Hampshire is not alone. I think most New England states are overwhelmingly car dependent. And New Hampshire, together with all of us, can't get to a net zero economy without really addressing the transportation sector. You've been a trans you've been a champ for transportation solutions. And I was hoping you might be able to talk about your top priorities for for electrification specifically. And um, and with a with a follow on, I guess, invitation to talk a little bit about your your vision for connecting Manchester to a regional rail system. Sure. Thank you so much for the question, Elizabeth. And it's great to be here with everyone and to hear the answers to these questions. Uh, because as I sit here, um, I realize we're, we share an awful lot in what we're doing. And I always find these conversations um, fantastic. So uh, through the Volkswagen settlement, we added 14 uh, propane fueled school buses to our fleet um, in an effort to improve our local air quality. And it's estimated that that will cut emissions um, from diesel buses by about 96%. Um, our hope obviously is to expand that to more of our bus MTA fleet, um, as well as um, the fleets within our departments, so the car fleets within our departments. Um, I've been a huge advocate for vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, we have it at a few locations here in the city, at the airport, for example, uh, but we really need to, and we want to do more uh, throughout the city to encourage that. Um, and then our recently adopted 10 year plan um, highlights climate friendly infrastructure. So specifically talks about uh, green streets, rails and trails to really encourage multi-mobility, biking, walking and additional parks. Um, you talked and mentioned rail. Um, I have been a huge advocate for rail from Boston to Manchester and I feel like um, we're getting closer and closer with that. So it's really encouraging news. Uh, last week, the Board of Mayor and Aldermen here in Manchester approved a rail station location in our downtown. Um, we know that, you know, train travel um, is, a, is a green way to travel. And um, by using that, it's, it's a 30% less um, energy per passenger per mile than cars. Um, so we, we really are um, optimistic that that'll happen sooner rather than later and really appreciate um, the funding that seems to be coming available um, to, to do that. That's great. Well, as, as your neighbor to the south, we'd love to have more rail connectivity between Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And I think this is a great segue to the next question. And I'm, I will turn it back to you, Mayor Craig. Um, it's hard for people to conceptualize $3.5 trillion. And it's hard for voters and constituents to understand what that means for them. So I'd like to invite each of you to reflect on the same question. And I'll turn to you in, in reverse order. Um, to localize this three and a half trillion dollar package. Specifically, what could this kind of federal investment mean for your community in terms of climate and energy? And what could you and your fellow leaders make possible in your cities and towns? So for me, I look at this opportunity as a once in a lifetime opportunity where we have these federal dollars that can really make a tremendous impact in our community. And the few things that I've thought about, obviously the transportation that I just talked about, that would be, be and would make a huge impact on our community. Um, for the last year and a half, the city has been working on our first major solar project here in the city of Manchester. Um, it will be going on a former, former landfill on the west side. Um, originally, it was planned for one megawatt because that was a limitation. Um, the governor, um, I believe, is going to be signing legislation that will allow us to expand to four megawatts. So that is our plan. So we're really excited about that. Uh, but being able to expand solar um, to more residents and throughout the city from a business perspective um, would be fantastic. And then I think just making it easier for communities to recognize and accept 
climate change, that climate change is real. And everything that we're doing from a planning perspective uh, to make sure that we are, are doing that. So um, we are going through a CSO project as the counselor had mentioned, um, you know, and our EPD di division really does bring, um, they begin their major projects by identifying what they need to do and what is required to address climate change and what those potential impacts are. And obviously some of those um, changes that need to happen will cost more money, but they're necessary. Um, and we all need to start looking at these major projects in the same way and make those changes now uh, for the future. Turning to you, Councillor Nichols. Yeah, this, this one was actually harder than I thought it would be, mostly because we have so many um, projects going on that I think would be worthwhile. Um, but trying to pick the few that are like worth highlighting that would actually be the most impact I think is hard because I mean the water and our sewer I mentioned but um, we seem to have a grip on that with our <laughs> with our funding um, but something we have been working on which is actually broadband which would actually limit I mean Maine is a pretty rural state and a lot of people commute to Bangor or Bangor people just I mean, I, until recently, I was commuting to Augusta every day to work. But if there was a way to have better broadband in our community, that would mean a lot less cars on the road. Um, and so that's something we've already been looking at and I, at identifying to try to use these funds for, but it's a project we've also been kind of working on. Um, actually, we have RFPs back, so we're actually reviewing them right now. So they're a lot closer to being finalized um, than I probably just hinted at. Um, but I think that would actually be a really, um, it's, it'd be a pretty impactful climate project, even though it's not usually what one thinks of as the immediate climate, but keeping people off the road and getting them more localized in their community is really important to us, especially in Maine, when we're so, and I'm sure this is actually really familiar to every other New England state, that we all drive a lot because there's or at least especially Vermont and New Hampshire where our public transit is not as intense, I think, as other um, like Connecticut and Massachusetts can be at, in places. So that'd be, that would be my big priority besides all the ones I had mentioned that we're already working on. That's great. And um, Councilor Lederman, what, what could you make possible in Springfield? You know, one of the things that came out of the original fight against the biomass incinerator is the fact that, you know, residents, advocates and, and elected officials in Springfield really began to look more closely at climate change and environmental justice issues and the way that they impact Springfield. And so while we've been working to hold off new polluters, uh, and while we've been trying to send a clear message that the days of, of rubber stamping polluters in communities like ours are over, we've also been really working to get ahead. Um, you know, since that time, we've put into place, written and put into place the Springfield Climate Action Plan uh, with a goal of reducing pollution by 80% by 2050. We're currently working on upgrading that goal to bring it into compliance with uh, what we know is what we need to do now, which is more. Uh, but we recently held a hearing and found that we completed 81% of that plan so far. We've saved millions of dollars by reducing energy usage, by upgrading municipal buildings. But we've been able to do that by working really hard you know, to get grant funds, to find funding, to be able to do this. The truth is, is that cities like Springfield are the ones that are in the most serious position of needing to respond to increased weather events and global climate change, um, but also are still having to spend so much money responding to the impacts of them. And so funds like this is so critical to help us really get ahead. One of the things that comes to mind um, is how much work we need to do to upgrade our housing infrastructure in the city of Springfield. We are one of the oldest cities in Massachusetts. Our housing structure is some of the oldest in Massachusetts. And what that means is that when we see these increased weather events like the heat waves that we've been experiencing, it is actually truly detrimental to the public health of our constituents. We know that there are people who are not able uh, to really adapt to that because they don't have air conditioning in their homes because their homes are not constructed for this. So I think that being able to put in place broader retrofitting and upgrading for homeowners and tenants is going to be important. That's also going to have an important public health benefit. We want to be able to increase solar on our buildings. We're replacing four new school buildings in Springfield uh, in the coming years, and they are solar ready, but we can't get reimbursed for solar installation 
um, through the funding formula that currently exists. So that's another example. And we talked about, you know, I know a lot of conversation has happened today about public transportation. Um, interestingly enough, in Western Massachusetts, we also face an issue with public transportation, even in the urban areas like the city of Springfield, because unfortunately, our RTAs are, are expected to be generating revenue as opposed to serving the community. Uh, and so to be able to make more investments in reducing the costs or making public transportation free and increasing the opportunity for routes in the city of Springfield uh, is going to be critical as well. And, and the last thing I'll say is relative to this three and a half million, as we create these jobs that our communities so desperately need, it's very important that we address child care. We know child care is an extremely serious expense for so many constituents. It is out of reach. We want our constituents to be able to secure those jobs and have the child care, safe, reliable, affordable child care to back it up in our communities while they are out there earning a living. So we know that we are out of time. And that means that now is the time to think big and towards the future. And that is what these funds will let us do. That's a great answer. I love how all of you are thinking so intersectionally about these issues of, of climate and environment. Um, so uh, let's turn it to you, Mayor Watson. What can you make possible? Yeah, thank you. Well, and I'm thinking too about um, your, your previous question, what will it take to move forward? And the short answer is money. And that is why this reconciliation bill is so important. Uh, we just had a net zero energy plan come out for the city of Montpelier. And even though we've made a lot of progress so far, we still have a substantial amount of work to do. And it's going to just take money. And that is where uh, this this bill could be a significant help. Uh, that we still have multiple municipal buildings that need to be weatherized, that need to be um, taken off of oil, uh, that need some fuel switching. And this is gonna make that possible. You know, I think about our, our school district, I think about our garage building and our rec center, uh, places that are not already, uh, uh, have, uh, that don't already have renewable sources of heat. You know, I also think about, kind of as uh, Councillor uh, Lederman uh, referenced, uh, we have a substantial amount of renters in the city of Montpelier. About 60% of our uh, housing units are rental apartments, and they, uh, they often don't have the agency to make weatherization decisions or fuel switching decisions, and so we need to make it uh, really easy and obvious for landlords to, again, make uh, energy efficiency and fuel switching decisions in our community. Uh, you know, it, it's, I think it's important to keep in mind that those with means and the agency to make the decisions for their own homes are going to be fine, right? They're going to be able to, uh, when, when oil becomes expensive, uh, they'll be able to make the switch to uh, cheaper renewable fuels. Uh, but those who are, are renters may be stuck uh, fa uh, facing higher fuel costs. And so uh, one of the hopes that I would have would be to uh, make this money available, particularly to, uh, to landlords, uh, particularly to, to protect the, the renting community, which is often um, you know, folks with lower incomes. Uh, and I also think about uh, protecting our small businesses making uh, grants and funding available to small businesses to make uh, their uh, facilities net zero. Uh, and then I also think about uh, public transit, uh, that there are there need to be opportunities for people to uh, get around to their jobs that do not require fossil fuels. And so as much as we can be switching our, uh, our infrastructure to support non-fossil fuel based transportation, whether that's uh, uh, public transit, ride shares, or uh, electric vehicles, all of these are necessary parts of the solution moving forward. Uh, and I think we need to make that, again, easy and obvious for people uh, in the future. And again, that just is going to take money uh, because people often vote with their, with their pocketbooks. You know, they're, they're making decisions based on what is financially in their best interest. And if we can uh, switch habits and practices uh, with this investment from this reconciliation bill, that will be a significant uh, and really important step uh, towards making our planet more livable. So I'm gonna to pivot to the, this next question here. And this is kind of a, what can we do question for those who are, for those who are listening. And 
you know, mayors and city councilors often enjoy a special relationship with, with members of the congressional delegation. Their members of Congress are often looking to you for feedback and input on, um, on local priorities. And you also have an opportunity sometimes to help shape how they're thinking about, um, how they're thinking about federal policy. So I'd like to ask um, about briefly for each of you to reflect on what can those who are listening today and the residents of your cities do to ensure that Congress is successfully passing this $3.5 trillion reconciliation package? Um, how, can, how can your constituents, your voters, help make the case that local climate action can only be scaled up with federal dollars? I will start with um, Councillor Lederman. I'll start with you. Well, I think the key, as always, is is reaching out. Um, you know, the the truth is is that the more calls, the more emails, and and the more conversations that our federal leaders have, um, not just with folks like us who serve in elected offices locally, uh, but with constituents across our communities, uh, moves us closer. Uh, and so, you know, tomorrow I'll be participating uh, in a, a friendly rally outside the federal courthouse in Springfield, uh, urging Congressman Neal uh, to put his efforts behind uh, this reconciliation bill. Um, and, and I would encourage everybody listening to reach out um, and tell their tell their Congress people and their senators that you know they appreciate the work that they are already doing. We are seeing unprecedented levels of funding come into our municipalities. Really, these are generational investments that we are already seeing through the American Rescue Plan, through CARES Act funding. And it shows that when our federal government puts their mind to it, the money is there to support our communities. Um, but you have to have a push behind it. When we, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, began writing letters as counselors and, and with community organizations uh, to our senators and our congressmen about the impacts we were starting to see in our community, about the amount of money that we were going to need for rental assistance, about the amount of money that we were going to need for unemployment. We never imagined that we would actually see that level of investment, but it came because there was an unprecedented push. And we need to recognize that climate change and the increased extreme weather events that we are going to be seeing are going to be as serious and as deadly for our constituents as COVID-19 was. And we need our federal representatives to recognize that as well and pass these bills. Great, I'll turn to you, Mayor Craig. Um, anything you'd like to add about how your constituents can help make the case? Yeah, I, I feel like in New Hampshire, we're, we're very fortunate. Our federal delegation is very accessible and they are in our communities, living in our communities. They're here all the time. You know, I share the same thoughts. Um, it's important that we all speak up. And I think what's most impactful is when our residents share personal stories about how, what, how these issues are impacting their lives. Um, you know, that's, that's really what resonates and that's what they take back to Congress and that's what really makes a difference. Um, so, you know, I would encourage residents to continue to do that. That's what they've, they've done. That's what they're so good at. Um, you know, they're living here, they're living through it. They need to share their stories. Mayor Watson, anything to add? Uh, well, I would uh, echo Council Lederman's uh, and uh, Mayor Craig's call to, to be in touch, to share stories. I guess I would add that uh, uh, if you are feeling motivated to do something about this, to uh, find a couple friends who might also want to um, also be in touch, because I think it is really very much about uh, the volume and uh, the, the pressure that, uh, that we as uh, as the constituents of these folks uh, to, it's, a, it's about putting pressure on them. Um, so uh, yeah, so find some friends, write some postcards, uh, make it social, make it fun uh, and get in touch. That's great advice. And Councilor Nichols? Yeah, that was kind of where I was going with it and going to echo everyone what they said about reaching out um, more specifically to Maine. I know um, Congressman Golden and um, has been his the kind of balls in the house's court right now and he's been on the fence about supporting it so I would but with him he's always accessible so trying to really give the personal stories on what how it's going to impact our district because he, um, we're split into two so I say CD2 a lot but that 
this part of Maine is going to be dramatically impacted, not just with our fisheries, but with our, um, just with our, the drought that we're experiencing up in Aroostook County. And so having those personal stories on how it's impacting their daily lives and how that's impacting the, their work, I think is something that resonates with him. And I think, so please reach out, to share those stories that really does make a difference. So interesting that the power of story, personal stories is coming through from, from all of you. Um, so there's been some activity in the Q&A um, and in the chat. I, um, I'm going to take a couple of themes and try to fold it into one question here. Um, and it really does relate to racial justice and equity and, um, and addressing overburdened communities. So, you know, we know that in addition to climate outcomes, President Biden's Build Back Better agenda is geared towards ensuring that 40% of climate and clean energy investments benefit low-income communities and communities of color. We know that these communities in town after town, state after state, have historically borne the brunt of fossil fuel pollution. And we also know that they are um, typically the most vulnerable to climate impacts. Um, several of you have touched on how you believe this um, this forty percent could make a difference in your cities, um, but um, an invitation to add any other context or color about um, about how this forty percent frame will impact your um, your jurisdiction. And and um, Mayor Watson, I'll start with you. Yeah. Again, I mean, this is. Um... One of the reasons that I am thinking particularly of the renting community uh, in Montpelier and uh, the uh, the kinds of uh, difficulties that our, our renting community faces, uh, you know, whether that's uh, lack of access to renewable energy or efficient um, house uh, energy efficient housing, uh, and so that's going to be uh, important for us uh, moving forward. Yeah. That's great. Mayor Craig. Yes, thank you. Um, Manchester is a very diverse community. So um, these funds would have a tremendous impact in our community. Um, you know, I was thinking we talked about the school buses. 60% um, of the kids in Manchester public schools are on free and reduced lunch. One of the things we're talking about right now, and, and um, in New Hampshire, we're not required um, to pay for buses for high school students. And so one of the things that we're talking about right now is if we had the funding, we would, we would not charge students um, to take a bus to school, which I believe is the right thing to do. Um, but also this funding would allow us to make some advancements from an infrastructure perspective in the inner city, which is very um, gray. Um, and so allow us to increase parks and walkability and, um, change some of the, you know, the, the two-way, one-way streets that are urban highways um, and do more of a green street effort um, that I believe would make a tremendous impact in those neighborhoods. That's terrific. Councillor Nichols? Yeah, so I should admit my, my battery low went blinking right as you were speaking. So if I missed, I may have missed part of the question. Um, but I think I, so if I miss a part of your question, that's why. So just, um, so Bangor is not the, I mean, I think this was settled in the census. We are not the most diverse, but we have more diversity than we did 10 years ago. So this is something that, so those funds, would really help and mostly in terms of housing. I think that has been men mentioned a few times by uh, Mayor Watson, but also Councillor Lederman in regards to our housing stock. And that really would affect, I mean, Bangor has some of the oldest housing stock in the country. And um, I mean, my house is over 120 years old and I think that's on the younger, it's about probably on the older side, but it's the majority of our homes. And so they're not very efficient and trying to, something we did a few years ago was actually in hopes to kind of reach that middle ground in terms of we have efficiency main here and so we're trying to complement that funding in terms of like making sure if someone wants to get a heat pump if they're more of a middle income or low income they could maybe get additional funds through the city to help make that happen and so trying to do projects like that that will help not not just um well that will help all people in our city that would really yeah, 
that's kind of where I was thinking about where we'd go with that is um, improving our housing stock. But also I, th I saw a comment from someone about our EV charging stations. I should probably mention that we did, we actually have been, that's something we've been investing in for a long time in Bangor. We have them all over. Um, and our, and I actually just got an email from our local power company to try to see how we can do more. So it, it's something we are working on. I just wanted to address that comment that I saw in the chat as well. So. Thank you. And Councillor Luderman. Certainly, you know, I mean, we've talked a lot today about the, the fact that, you know, communities like Springfield have you know faced the the brunt and the impacts of pollution for generations um, we're seeing a, a systemic shift in policy thanks to so many activists across the commonwealth who helped pass the environmental justice policy for multiple state agencies including dep and doer so that we can see the increased protections that are really necessary um, but as we talk about the fact that our communities are going to be hit the hardest and are the least prepared. Um, you know, my advocacy on policy has always been that as we look at environmental policy and combating climate change, we can't do it on the backs of the people that can afford it the least and are impacted the most. Um, and so I think the fact that, that this proposal exists in the reconciliation bill is really a testament to how we have shifted the conversation around uh, environmental justice in, in the Commonwealth and in this country. And that has to go forward. Um, so I think everything that, that we've talked about today points in that direction. I think that the other conversation to have is, you know, about the the fact that folks who are in a position to continue to kind of carry on um, in the face of extreme weather events and climate change, uh, as Mayor Watson said, the folks that have the money to make the transition will make the transition. Some folks will also continue their activities because they won't be impacted by it. And so for our constituents, it really is going to become a matter of life or death, uh, especially when it comes to heat waves. And that's why I make the comparison uh, to COVID-19. I also wanted to jump in on the EV charging stations because I've been thinking a lot about this lately. So, I mean, we're investing in EV charging stations in the city of Springfield. We have them in, in multiple neighborhoods, but there has to be more investment from the federal and state government in making electric vehicles actually accessible uh, to our constituencies. Because right now, even with the rebates that exist, those, those rebates are not accessible to enough people and it, the way that they are given, it does not actually make these cars affordable for the vast majority of my constituents at, at several different income levels. And furthermore, I mean, you're still talking about more than $30,000, even with rebates for one that could put you in a position to be able to get the range that you need. So if we are going to see, which we must see a switch to electrification of personal vehicles, we need to see significantly more investment from the federal government in not just rebates, but in actual subsidy for people to be able to swap out their vehicles. And that's gonna be a broader conversation that we're gonna to have to have. That's great. So I've got one more question here and then I'll give each of you an opportunity for a brief closing remarks. Um, the question really relates to your voters and your constituents. Um, there's a, a question here about do, 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 do your voters care about this? As, as you're going door to door, as you're answering constituent mail, what are you hearing from, from them? Um, and Councillor Nichols, I'll give you a moment to just characterize what, what you're hearing. Yeah, so I've now run for office twice or I've gotten reelected at least once. And there's been a huge shift between the first election and this election. The first one was in 2015. And you, I am hearing more from our constituents just on a regular basis regarding, I mean, the whole climate emergency, the draft actually came from a constituent. It was not, I mean, it was stuff we were already doing a, a lot of it, but we had not contextualized that into an actual resolve to really put it real into, re, to really put it into motion. And so I think that actually came from one of our high school students um, who, who's impressive in her own right. Um, but so I have been hearing more and people are getting more concerned and actually wanting to know what we're doing in regards to just on a municipal level. Um, trying to care, I mean, outside of Bangor, I think it's still hard because I think a lot of people, I think we do need to educate how you can do that and also still be the rural state that we are because I think that is the biggest challenge we have. I mean, Bangor, our catchment area is all the way Fort Kent, which is one of our most northern communities, it is also needs comes down to Bangor to get services. And so we're having a range of people needing 
our community in order to survive. And so how to make it more, I mean, rural health, all of those things more accessible and better. So we are not, people are not having to drive and commute and also not that I, I mean, yes, I love being a service center, but it does drain in, in terms of trying to reduce our climate impact. And so that is sort of the things I'm looking at outside of Bangor, how we can be help assist those other communities, not necessarily financially but, um, all the time, but in how we can make it happen so they can stay in place and be more local with their community and get the services they need. And so obviously help with our commuting and emissions. Mayor Watson, what are you hearing from, from voters and constituents? Yeah, uh, voters in Montpelier have uh, supported climate uh, related, renewable energy related projects for many years. Uh, but that's actually also very typical of uh, Vermonters. Uh, something like 70% of Vermonters are, are, con are concerned about climate change uh, and uh, are uh, interested in uh, climate action. And uh, this, is, this has been true for years. It's been true across multiple mayors in Montpelier. Uh, and I am, I'm certainly uh, seeing that continue. And I would actually add that I think in, especially since the, the most recent I, IPCC report, as well as particularly since the, um, the fires uh, that have been sending smoke down our way from uh, the Northwest, <clears throat> um, we are and in California. We're uh, it's it's a little um, it's very present, you know, to see uh, the smoke uh, uh, impacting uh, visibility. Uh, it really feels like oh gosh, like the, uh, climate change is really happening now, and it is urgent. Uh, and uh, so that's that's sort of the sense that I am getting from folks. Uh, now is that it's it's being ratcheted up a level from uh, caring about it and wanting to do something about it to like, oh, this is urgent. This is a high priority. Mayor Craig. Thank you. I agree with everything that's been said. And I would just add that, especially when it comes to young people, um, this is one of their top priorities. I have a daughter who's in high school. Um, and, and they're talking about this today uh, and, and they care. And so we're seeing young people, young voters who are really engaged and really pushing um, to see change. And I think that's very exciting. That's great. And, and Councilor Lederman. When I uh, first announced my candidacy in 2017, there was a local media outlet that ran a headline and the headline was Springfield environmentalist Jesse Letterman announces run for city council. And there was a, a, a political advisor of mine who said, oh, I don't, I don't know if that's going to help us, right? You, you do so much more than just environmental work. I won that election. And when we, when we work through and walk through through and talk with folks in our community, um, they recognize the real impact that these policies have on their lives. Springfield has historically had one of the highest asthma rates in the Commonwealth. We were named two years in a row on the asthma capital list as number one uh, by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. And by working to keep new polluters out and by working with larger polluters in our community to transition them to more uh, efficient methods, um, we've seen that drop. So people are realizing that that these real policies have real impacts on their family and for you know parents struggling with their kids asthma when they recognize that by putting these policies in place, we can improve their lives. Um, you see this become a priority for them. So now four years later, you see other candidates running, putting environmental issues on their platform. And we really welcome them. And let's be clear. I mean, I've passed legislation on a whole wide variety of things, but this is truly one of the most pressing issues facing our communities. And I know that the voters recognize that. All right, so I'm gonna give you each, you know, 30 seconds or a minute to close with your final remarks of call to action. Um, so let's, let's pivot back to you, Mayor Craig. Any last words? Yes, I just wanna thank you for hosting this conversation. It's been very enlightening and educational. I appreciate everyone participating. And I guess I would just really say that it's imperative that Congress pass 
um, this bill that makes bold investments um, that are needed to tackle climate crisis um, and make it easier for our communities to transition to uh, clean energy. It's, it's time. It's time. And Councilor Nichols. Yeah, first, thank you again um, for hosting this. And I would, I was just going to advocate, especially to email for my constituents, please email and reach out to Congressman Golden's office. He um, still is on the precipice of hopefully voting in support of this, um, but I think he really needs to hear those stories. And I think that this really does need to pass if we're going to make any sort of headway in our, in our half of the state. So thank you again. Councilor Letterman. Well, just thank you so much, Elizabeth, to you and, and ELM. And it's great to be here too with, with and meet these colleagues from, you know, across New England, um, especially uh, those that have served on their city councils. I always say city councils are, are the closest elected body to the people. And that's really where we get to see firsthand um, the impacts of, of what this policy really can do. So I agree, reach out to your, your local elected officials, reach out to your state and federal elected officials, tell them why this is so important to you. And, and also get involved locally. Reach out to your local organizations that are pushing for change in your communities. And if you're not getting the response that you want, run for office yourself. All right, and then uh, closing as we, as we began with you, Mayor, Mayor Watson. Yeah, thank you. I just wanna say what an honor it is to be here with, with you all. I think uh, as folks involved in local government, we have, uh, a very clear understanding of how climate change is impacting our communities. We are the, the closest to the ground, so to speak, in terms of uh, the impacts of policy on our communities. And so I think we have a, a good understanding of how uh, climate change is, is impacting uh, our communities. And we uh, are basically out of time. We must act on climate change now. Uh, so it is imperative uh, that uh, the reconciliation bill include significant amount uh, of money to go towards energy efficiency and renewable energy, uh, putting people back to work and with good paying jobs uh, to make our planet more livable, uh, particularly uh, improving the lives of uh, those affected by climate change the most, our, our communities uh, with low incomes and communities of color. Uh, and so very grateful uh, for this time and thank you for organizing this. Uh, this is uh, a hugely important uh, piece of legislation uh, in our, our country, perhaps, and as somebody said earlier, this is a, a generational piece of uh, legislation and uh, it, it needs to be um, uh, significantly impacting uh, the climate work around the country. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of you, our distinguished panel attendees and the press who've joined us today. If you want to take action, the League of Conservation Voters, ELM Action Fund, New Hampshire LCV, Maine Conservation Voters, and Vermont Conservation Voters are here to help. As you've heard today, this really is a make or break moment for climate action. We are all in, uh, we're working together with EJ and labor leaders, the private sector, elected leaders at all levels to help get this done. So we're now counting on Congress to enact President Biden's full Build Back Better agenda as soon as possible. Thank you all, have a great afternoon. Thank you.